did you have him? After you, just after you. So as after Brother Warren Wilcox, I believe, had passed away, and uh, who always taught the Christian Evidences course, and but it was that class that lit a fire under me. And uh, many of you, you, some of you, have been through my bookshelf back there and all my Christian Evidences books and and things. And it's 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 one of my hobbies. And, uh, and so this has, been, this has been a thrilling day and weekend for me, but there is, Brad has a lot of material out in the foyer of stuff that he, both he himself and through Focus Press that they provide. And uh, so if you want to continue to study some of these things, um, there's a wealth of information material on the table out in the foyer. And uh, if there's anything else, we will do everything we can to try to help you find answers and find material. So. Just, just let us know. But uh, again, we want to, we want to, uh, um, as as we we look at this, this is first one one of the first times I called Brad is when I was preaching in Porter, Oklahoma, and uh, the Tulsa Zoo has one entire building just dedicated to the origin of life, and when you walk in the front door, it says the Origin of Life Museum. And I went through that museum and took pictures of everything and took notes of everything. And I started putting my own presentation to start doing tours through and do a Christian Evidences tour through the, that museum. And, uh, and I contacted Brad at the time and said, I want to do a Christian Evidence uh, seminar at the zoo, at the uh, amphitheater at the zoo. And, uh, and as word got out to the, those at the zoo, um, they tried to shut that down. And uh, um, I was already in contact with um, Jay Siculo, uh with uh, American, what, what is it, ACLJ, American Civil Liberties and Justice. Um, and uh, he's a lawyer. He's seen many cases in front of the Supreme Court. And this was back before he had gotten really big in what they are now. And, and uh, and he told me, he said, if you want to make a big deal out of it, let me know. And we'll take it to them. Because they weren't wanting to allow us to do a Christian evidence seminar there at the zoo. And he was willing to make this a big deal. Put it in the press and everything. And, and we did never make it happen. But uh, um, this, this, this information needs to be just saturating our society. Because we already know what's saturating our society. And it's affecting too many people. And so we need to do our best to, uh, to do our part. So let's begin with a word of prayer this evening, and then I'll turn it over to Brad. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we come to you again. As we finish this day, Father, we pray that you will continue to help us to have uh, our minds open, our hearts open, as we continue to look at not only evidence, that draws us closer to you and to your word, but also the evidence of the lies and the things that we see in the world. You told us that we are are living in a world that's crooked and perverse. And Father, as the world tries to twist things and tries to convince us of things that are not true, we pray that you will help us to have the wisdom and the understanding and simply the, the faith and the trust in your word and knowing that it is true, it is always true, and that we can rely on it every time. Again, we thank you for the example of your son, Jesus. No matter what the, the trials were, no matter what the conflict was that he, he was faced with, he continued to prove to us that if we rely on you and your truth, that in the end we will all have that victory, the same as he had. We thank you for him, for his example, his sacrifice, for all that we can do to learn to walk in his steps every day. It's in his holy name that we pray. Amen. So we are, we're going to wrap up with an exhaustive study on gluttony. (laughs) Just kidding. Um, Steve was talking about the Tulsa Zoo. I actually, I have the distinction of being kicked out of a museum uh, on camera. That was an interesting treat. We had a, a congregation that asked me to come in and, and do a seminar 
And the preacher called about a month or so early, and he said, hey, they just built a brand new museum using taxpayer dollars. Would you mind taking some of the homeschoolers, some of the families through that, and just pointing out the errors and teaching what's true? And I said, absolutely, I'd love to do that. Well, news got out, literally, to the news stations, and some of them started calling the museum saying, hey, when's that guy coming to refute your, your new museum? And we showed up, news cameras right behind us, and they had hired additional security guards, wouldn't let us in. Um, finally, we were able to kind of get our foot in the door, and long story short, they didn't like that we were pointing out error, and so we got sent away. So it's interesting to me, if whatever you have is truth, it ought to be able to stand up to scrutiny. Amen? Which is why I tell young people, hey, ask your questions. Criticize this thing as much as you want because it's been standing up for 2,000 years to everything that people can throw at it. And it's still here. So, you know, if it's truth, it will survive. And yet, sadly, they don't want us even questioning their theory. While we're talking about that, let's talk about the guy who is behind that theory. If I can get my clicker working. Uh Uh-oh. Operator error. There we go. Charles Darwin, born. Back up. February the 12th, 1809, his mom died when he was very young. He was about eight years old. So this is a young boy who is raised primarily from his father. His father and his grandfather were both physicians. So what do you think Charles Darwin was expected to be? He was expected to carry on the family tradition of being a family practitioner, a physician. At the tender age of 16, he was sent off to the University of Edinburgh to medical school. And he learned, quite literally, while he was there, he couldn't cut it. And what I mean by that is he didn't like the sight of blood. This was back in the day before anesthesia. You know, part of a medical student's job during that time was to physically hold down patients as they were cutting them open. Charles Darwin didn't want to have anything to do with that. So he writes home, he tells his dad. His dad realizes there's only one profession that really could kind of save the family name. And that's if he went into the ministry. So they pack him up, they send him off to Cambridge, where he received the only degree that he would ever get in theology. Now, how how ironic is it that the guy who most people in science elevate as some kind of a a god, the only degree he ever got was in Bible. So while he's there, while he's at Cambridge, Charles Darwin met one of his professors, a guy by the name of John Stevens Henslow, who was a botanist. He was also a priest. But one of the things Henslow liked to do, he liked to go out and collect flowers, plants. And so Charles Darwin oftentimes would accompany him. He realized Darwin had a knack for identifying different species. And it was actually Henslow who got him a job. It was a voluntary position on a boat the year he graduated. So Imagine, if you will, Darwin graduates, he's supposed to get onto a boat for two years and go all the way around the earth collecting things. He learned two things in that journey, by the way. It was supposed to be two years, ended up being five. He learned that he was very prone to seasickness. You read that in his autobiography, he spent a lot of time in the bottom of that boat throwing up. But he also learned he was, had a really good knack at collecting things. Every time that they would make land, he'd jump off, he would collect plants and animals, send them back to England. So picture in your mind, they make their way around the southern tip of South America. They come up to Ecuador. 
they head out right on the equator, about 500 miles off of the coast of Ecuador, they hit a group of islands called the Galapagos Islands. And it was there really that his, cha- his mentality, his worldview really started changing. In fact, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to kind of walk in his footsteps on the Galapagos Islands and, and to see what he wrote about, you know, he talked about basically it was like stepping back in time where you see animals that you only see in the Galapagos. You know, those massive tortoises that you can ride, all kinds of unique creatures that quite literally that's the only place you'll find them. Uh, In fact, I'll share a real quick story about, this is uh, actually a a small one. This is a uh, marine iguana. They actually can swim in salt water, and they'll spit the, the salt out. It's interesting. But when we were filming, we actually had to get up before everybody else did. We were kind of a, had merged into this tour group. Which meant we were filming at like 5 in the morning. So one morning, about 5 o'clock, we're out on the beach. We've got cameras rolling. And we see this, this divot all throughout the beach. We're like, what in the world? So we made the dumb mistake of, hey, let's follow that. We did. All the way up the beach, and we come face to face with one of these things that's about six feet long, and that's not an exaggeration. Now, thankfully, I learned that they're vegetarian. Did not know that at the time. That would have been really useful information back then. But again, lots and lots of creatures that you only see there. The one that really caught his eye, though, were the finches. Thirteen different finches scattered out on these little group of islands. Here's what he did. He was able to capture some, stuff them, send them back to England, and then he completed his journey. He gets back to his office. He's going through all this stuff that he sent. He comes across these finches, and he looks at them thinking, okay, there is no way that God put 13 or 14 different birds, different types of finches on these islands. Surely what happened is uh, an original pair made it on a boat from Ecuador and, and those pair that they bred and eventually you got all these. And so in his notes, here's what he actually drew. He drew this branching diagram trying to explain how you could get all of these different finches. Okay, up to this point, he was using pretty decent logic. And then he just absolutely flushed it all down the drain. Because what he did was he took this idea and he applied it to everything and said, you know what, instead of it being like a a, a branch for finches and them having their own little deal, maybe we're all a part of the same tree And at the base of that tree, there's a common ancestor that we all evolved from. And so lo and behold, he comes up with this idea of this evolutionary tree. He wrote his book, 1859. I mentioned it yesterday. I was kind of watching some of y'all just to see if if you caught how quickly I ran. I, I mentioned the title. I didn't give you the full title, okay? They don't even print the full title on the book anymore. Charles Darwin actually titled his book, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Favored races? Yeah, it means basically exactly what you thought it means. By the way, I, I, Steve mentioned that I, I taught at Bear Valley um, one of the things I was sort of kind of known for, I, I like to give very thorough exams, okay? Translate that into like 16, 18 pages. I, I like to make sure students learn. I give them learning opportunities. One of the questions that I remember asking is, what was very unique about Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of Species? Answer, He never actually gave you what the origin of species was. 
You would think if you're going to write a book and say, hey, you know, we're going to talk about the origin of species, that you would actually eventually get down and talk about, well, species came from this. He didn't do that. In fact, in his own book, he had a chapter where he talked about the fact that his theory has some problems. In fact, there's a whole lot of stuff that didn't fit. Listen to his own words. He said, why, if species have descended from other species by insensibly fine gradations, do we not everywhere see innumerable transitional forms? Charles Darwin knew his theory had a problem in that if it was correct, there should be missing links all over the place. But here was his prediction. He said within the next hundred years or so, we would find all kinds of missing links. Yeah, that was 150 plus years ago. And guess what? We still haven't found them. You say, oh, I, th I think we have, Brad. I, I read about some of those in my textbooks. Yeah, Let, let's talk, uh, let's think about real missing links. Dr. Colin Patterson was the senior paleontologist, British Museum, wrote a book in which he was talking about various things. He got a, a letter from a guy by the name of Luther Sunderland, and, and he was saying, hey, why didn't you mention any missing links in your latest book? Here's what this guy said back to him. I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil. Okay, now that's from the senior paleontologist of the British Museum of Natural History. If he's saying we don't have any, then why are books acting like we got them all figured out? But we've all seen the pictures, haven't we? You guys know what I'm talking about, the, the alleged missing links. About every nine months or so, I can just about count on Time Magazine, Newsweek, one of the, the mainstream media coming out with a, a headline, hey, we found the oldest humanoid fossil. We got a, a toad that's a gazillion years old, and we got a... And, and I just sit at my desk, honestly. I just sit there and laugh because I know what's going to happen. You know, when it first comes out, big news, cover story, and then usually after about four weeks, what happens is real scientists will start to look into the data, start looking into their methods, how did they do this, where did they find things, and they start picking it apart and realizing, that's bogus, that's no good. And it never makes the front page that, hey, that, this wasn't any good. Look at the guy on the right-hand side. His scientific name, Artipithecus Romidus Cadaba. He goes by Artie for short. Okay, this is the guy who is replacing Lucy as the alleged missing link. Big bold heading of how apes became human. Now you would think, Time Magazine cover story, surely you know we got enough info, evidence, right, to prove this stuff. The subheading says what a new fossil discovery tells scientists about our oldest ancestors, how they stood on two legs and made an evolutionary leap. Anytime you see something like this, from this day forward, here's what I want you to train yourself to do. Ask a simple question of where's your evidence. If you're going to tell me that I evolved from some ape, where's your evidence? Because when you actually get into the meat of this particular scientific article and this issue of time, here's what you realize. They don't have a whole lot. In fact, let me orient over here, if you look in the top right, you've got some finger bones. Below that, you've got a couple of molars or back teeth. You've got part of the head of a femur. You've got a single toe bone. Almost everything you see right in the middle, those are all teeth. You've got part of the mandible. You've got some of the small bones of the arm. That's it. 
One of the things I want you to notice, if you look carefully, you see these white lines dividing it into five different boxes? The reason it's divided into five different boxes is because those fossils were found in five different locations. So they're not all collected together, right? In fact, take a look at what the article says. Hale Celeste and his colleagues haven't collected enough bones yet to reconstruct with great precision what Kadaba looked like. But they do know that it was about the size of a modern common chimpanzee, which when standing averaged about four feet tall. All right, so let me get this straight. We haven't collected enough bones to know what this guy looks like, and yet we're going to put his picture on the cover of Time in a two-page spread. We're going to add him to the textbooks and put him in museums? Oh, yeah. But that's not the best part. Here's the best part. They have a picture of that single toe bone, right, with a caption underneath it that says, this toe bone proves the creature walked on two legs. Folks, I, I got a doctorate in anatomy and neurobiology. I've looked at a lot of dead people, okay? Five, six hundred cadavers. I, I've had to know more about feet and bones than I ever want to know. Twenty-six bones in the feet. They've got one. From that one bone, they're going to say, this proves the creature walked on two legs. I would remind you, by the way, this is the only bone they have south of the head of the femur. Right? Take a look at another admission that they buried in this article, talking about the toe bone. They said not only is it separated in time by several hundred thousand years, but it was also found some ten miles away from the rest of those bones. Guess it just walked away? I mean, think about that for just a moment. Let's say you're out front, right here in the church building. You dig up, you find some bones. You get a call from somebody over by the mall, 10 miles away. Hey, I, I got a toe bone. I think it goes with your collection. You'd be like, you, you're, you've lost your mind. What I want us to do for just a few minutes is I, I want to walk through what I call is evolution's hall of shame. Okay, this is a long hall. It's got lots of doors. This is the hallway that they never, ever show our children in the classroom. This guy right here, he's my favorite. Nebraska man. Nebraska man was actually used as evidence for evolution at the Scopes Monkey Trial. When you read the transcript, you'll see that they brought this guy in as proof that evolution is true. In fact, 1922, they put this picture in the Illustrated London News as proof of Nebraska man. So again, we ask the question, all right, where's your evidence? I mean, if, you, if you're going to use this as evidence in a trial, if you're going to put it in the Illustrated London News, surely you got evidence, right? Folks, every bit of it revolves around a single tooth. It looks like four on the screen. That's actually the same tooth taken from four different vantage points. From that one tooth, we get this guy and his wife. Here's the really sad part. After they introduced this into a courtroom as proof for evolution, after they put it in the Illustrated London News, about 30 years later, they discovered that that one tooth belonged to an extinct pig. That didn't make it into the headlines. Now, they'd already named it. They'd already justified it. But they suppressed the truth, just like Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Or how about this guy, Piltdown Man? There you see a, an artist's depiction of what he would allegedly look like, a, a sketch Again, we ask that question, where's your evidence? Well, this time, we've got to go to a gravel pit, built down England. 1912, they discovered some pieces of a skull, some pieces of a jawbone. They put them all together. They gave it this name, Piltdown Man, 
And you'll notice on the screen, I circled where it says more than 40 years. For more than 40 years, this guy was touted as the missing link. Took us 40 years to realize we've been lied to. Because what they actually did was they took a fairly modern human skull. They broke it on purpose. They took the jawbone of an orangutan. They filed down the back teeth of that orangutan to make it look more human. They dipped the whole thing in acid to age it. And then they buried it so they could discover it later on. And for 40 years, people bought it. Or, or how about this one, Lucy? Lucy's real name, Australopithecus afarensis. You know how she got her nickname? The guy who made the discovery, Donald Johansson, the night that they found all of these bones, they were in the Afar region of Africa. They had a record player. And for everybody under the age of 15, ask your grandparents what a record player is, they'll tell you. Actually, vinyls are coming back. They had one record that kept playing over and over and over all night long as they were celebrating that they're fine. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And the name stuck. Now, he became very well known, very famous, very wealthy from this discovery, but that was over 30 years ago. And we've had over 30 years to actually look at what he found, and I'm not going to go through every single one of these points with you, but I am going to point out a couple of problems with Lucy. I, I spent a couple of, year, couple of years, a couple of months of my life doing anatomical studies comparisons with Lucy fossils versus humans. Let me share with you a couple of things on the screen. Like number two talks about locked wrist. You know, quadrupeds, animals that walk on all fours, they have the ability to lock their wrist. When Lucy was first presented on the scene, they said, oh, no, she's upright walking. She's a transition to becoming a human. Yeah, well, then we actually looked at her fossils and realized, no, she got locking wrist just like a chimpanzee. Maggie Fox said, a chance discovery made by looking at a cast of the bones of Lucy, the most famous fossil of Australopithecus afarensis, shows that her wrist is stiff like a chimpanzee's. This suggests that her ancestors walked on their knuckles. Or how about, how about the fourth point on this screen? Talking about her rib cage. Human beings, all humans have barrel-shaped rib cages, okay? There's some people in this room got really big barrels. <laughs> I ain't about to point. Chimpanzees, they have conical-shaped rib cages, okay? It kind of looks like an ice cream cone. It gets smaller like this. When Lucy was first presented on the scene, they said, hey, she has a barrel-shaped ribcage. She's on her way to becoming a human. Then they started sending replicas to museums all across the country. Take a look at what Peter Schmidt had to say when he received their replica. He said, when I started to put the skeleton together, I expected it to look human. Everyone had talked about Lucy being very modern, very human, so I was surprised by what I saw. I noticed the ribs were more round in cross-section, more like what you see in apes. He said human ribs are more flatter in cross-section, but the shape of the rib cage itself was the biggest surprise of all. He said the human rib cage is barrel-shaped, and I just couldn't get Lucy's ribs to fit this kind of shape. But I could get them to make a conical-shaped rib cage, like what you see in apes. You see, as you start to look at all of the data, what you realize is Lucy was nothing more than an adult male pygmy chimp. You say, wait, male? Yeah, look at the sixth point on the screen. They've done every kind of computer-aided drafting, every measurement of every kind, trying to figure out how they would squeeze an infant through her pelvis. 
Ain't happening. Which means really we ought to be calling Lucy Lucifer, right? It's interesting to me, lots of people in this room have seen an image just like this one. It's a staple in the textbooks. In fact, I can remember Professor Don Davenport in Kentucky looked me and my classmates in the eye and told us this was the link that got us back to the apes. It's interesting, though, as you look at that, all eight of the images on the screen behind me, all eight of those have been sold as authentic representations of Lucy. And yet, when you stop and you really start looking at it, it's like, okay, wait a second. Um, which way were the ribs actually going? And what about the jaw? Those jaws don't all look the same. By the way, how many ribs did she have? Because some of those, some of them got five. Some of them got seven. It kind of makes you want to say, hey, would the real Lucy please stand up like the old game show? except she couldn't because she was a quadruped. Went to the St. Louis Zoo. Steve was talking about the Tulsa Zoo. St. Louis Zoo also had a, they called it the Living World Exhibit, where basically it was a shrine to Charles Darwin, right? In that exhibit, they had a Lucy replica. I took a picture because I was a little bit frustrated. Let me back up for just a second. How many feet bone are in that particular image? Or how, how many bones below, say, the, the junction of the knee do you see? Answer, you don't have any bones of the feet, right? Or, or how much hair do those bone, would those bones have on the person? You, you don't know anything about hair, right? And so we actually contacted them and said, hey, that... The image that you are presenting is totally bogus. I mean, realistically, that's not for education. That's for indoctrination. I want you to take a look at what zoo officials responded. A guy by the name of Bruce Carr, here's what he said. Zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. We cannot be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. We think the overall impression this exhibit creates is correct. In other words, it sells the image we want it to sell. Now, let's go to a universe. Let's go to the University of Arkansas for just a minute, okay? We're going to go to the science department of the University of Arkansas. I was about to say because the football department doesn't show up. But anyway, <laughs> we'll go to the science department. And let's say that I, I'm a professor there and I want a grant. Not, not, a, not a huge grant, but like, say, $3.2 million. That's a, that's a normal grant. $3.2 million for three years. They normally give them in three-year allotments. So, here's what you do. You spend six months writing this grant, backing it up with research. The reason I can speak of this, I actually helped a couple of professors write grants. So, you spend a long time. You're writing this grant. You send it in. It gets funded. You know what you do the next year? Nothing. Because you're tired from writing the grant. You just sit back and cruise. Now, year two comes along, and you realize, oh, I'm going to have to show something. So you get busy, and we go somewhere, and we're digging. We're looking for anything we can find, right? We've got to find some bones. We, we want something to support our grant. As the end of year two is rolling around, here's what happens. Pressure gets really strong to start putting something in writing. I, I need to actually publish something in a journal so that I can get my grant renewed. So here's what I tell all my graduate students. 
Graduate students, that would be a, another term for slaves. I tell them, go find me anything you can. Any bone, teeth, anything. You, and that we collect it all together. We get some Elmer's glue. And all of a sudden, we have got not just a, an old humanoid fossil. I'm going to go ahead and call it the oldest because after all, if it's the oldest, it's going to get more attention, more likely to get my grant renewed. And man, that's a big deal if it's like one of the old. So I'm going to date this thing at like 5.1 million years old. I'm going to give it a really cool scientific name. I, I may twist a little bit of wherever we're digging. I, I may put that in the name, but I'm sure going to put like my wife or, or me or, you know, like Bradina or something really cool into that name. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask for more money for another grant. Anybody see a problem with this whole deal? You should. Because that's not real accurate science. What that is is I'm going to throw something in front of you to justify why you gave me $3.2 million. Hoping that I get another 3.2. How about this guy? Neanderthal man. Now, I, I realize there are some ladies in this room right now that think your husbands live like a Neanderthal. That does not mean evolution is true, okay? This is National Geographic's cover girl, so to speak. They love this thing. Which, by the way, anybody think that it matters what magazines you bring into your house? Talk to a guy who, I won't mention his name, but I'll simply say he was in his early 70s, served as an elder for over a decade, an elder in the church for over a decade, and he was talking to me on the phone about why he completely abandoned the church and is no longer a Christian. And in that conversation, as I was picking his brain, trying to figure out why this guy would give it all up, he told me, he said, you know, Brad, when I was young, my family, we got two magazines like clockwork in our house every single month, Life Magazine and National Geographic. And he said, to this day, I can remember going down into our basement, flipping through that National Geographic, looking at those pictures, and he said, Brad, it just stuck with me. He said, there's just no way you can harmonize all of those pictures with the Bible. And he left me with this comment right here. I just don't think there's any way all those pictures could be wrong. Now, folks, let me make sure you understand. These are just scientific illustrations of somebody who thinks that may be how it looks. You gave the same bone to somebody else, guess what they're going to draw? Something totally different, right? Neanderthal man is the guy who allegedly is the closest to us. So <clears throat> this would be our closest cousin. In the background, you see a human skull. <clears throat> In the foreground, you see a Neanderthal skull. The main difference is that prominent brow ridge right there. So... Somebody digs this thing up, sees this brow ridge, says, hey, that's got to be a different creature. I'm going to give it a different name. But it looks a whole lot like us, so on the timeline, we're going to put it very close <coughs> to modern human, to, to homo sapien. So that's what they did. The only problem with that is, in 1958, a guy by the name of Dr. A.J. Cave actually examined the original Neander Valley fossils, <coughs> and he proved that it was nothing more than a guy who had suffered from advanced stages of arthritis. Question, does arthritis change bone structure? Mm-hmm. Absolutely it does. In fact, in this room right now, if I were to ask, anybody in here have arthritis, Rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis, 
believe it or not, there are going to be some people in this room that actually have bone disorders. Right? Right. Now, add to that, in this room, as I'm looking at you, there's a lot of variation just in size. We got normal skulls. We got some children's skulls. We got some fat heads, some little heads. Some. So you take all that variation and you mix in diseases and illnesses. As a scientist, would I expect to see maybe some abnormalities? All right, now let's throw in the clincher. Neander Valley, Germany, northern Europe, doesn't get a whole lot of sunlight. Now, we talked earlier today a little bit about sunlight. We need sunlight because we make vitamin D. So if you don't get enough sunlight, you're not going to be able to absorb calcium. Without calcium, guess what? All kinds of bone deformalities, right? So as a scientist, would I expect to maybe find some, some fossils in Neander Valley, Germany, that might actually, oh, I don't know, have some abnormalities? Yeah, I would. A buddy of mine, Jack Cuzo, has studied them a lot more than I have. He wrote a book called Buried Alive. In that, he said this, you must understand the skull really cries out disease. The teeth are badly decayed. The bones of the vault of the skull are extremely thick. There are many features that testify of acromegalia, acromelgia, or the excessive secretion of growth hormone in adulthood. What are you saying, Jack? Are you saying that this is a missing link? No, I'm saying it's a diseased human. And yet, we're going to start calling them Neanderthals. So what does the fossil record really show? I'm going to let a guy named Jeremy Rifkin tell you because I think he summed it up beautifully. He said, what the record shows is nearly a century of fudging and finagling by scientists attempting to force various fossil morsels and fragments to conform with Darwin's notions, all to no avail. <coughs> he said, today, the millions of fossils stand as very visible, ever-present reminders of the paltriness of the arguments and the overall shabbiness of the theory that marches under the banner of evolution. He's right. Folks, that evolutionary hall of shame is long. It's got lots of doors, lots of problems. And if you really want to know what is the truth, God created apes and he created humans. He created one with souls that are going to be somewhere for eternity and he created animals. Interesting, he spoke all the creatures into existence, but when it came to man, the text says, let us create man in our image according to our likeness. Us, our, and our. Those are plural words, right? You realize there was a conference of the Godhead before he made man? We were different than the animals. He just spoke them into existence. And yet, again... This evolutionary thing has taken fire. So much so, there's textbooks out there proclaiming, oh yeah, it's a fact, not a theory. Birds arose from non-birds, humans from non-humans. No person who has any understanding in the natural world can deny these facts any more than he or she can deny that the earth is round, rotates on its axis, or revolves around the sun. Now, thankfully, this textbook actually got slapped on the wrist for writing that it was a fact because you can't technically say it's a fact, right? A couple of years later, they came out with an updated version. Take a look at how they reworded it to get around this idea. I'm reading from the middle of the page. I'll blow it up so that you guys can see it. it says, scientific discoveries may be broadly categorized into four groups. Facts, hypothesis, laws, and theories. Notice this. In order of increasing importance. So now we're going to say that a theory is of more importance than a, a fact or a scientific law? Yeah. 
And so, yeah, they'll call it a theory. As long as you elevate theory above what is a fact and a law. Some of you have seen images like this one where they try to prove, hey, evolution is true because, you know, we've we got examples like the peppered moths. Here's the story they tell. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, there were supposedly 95% of these light-colored moths, 5% of the dark. And the story was the birds could easily spot the black ones. They'd eat them off the trees. And then the Industrial Revolution happened. Soot, ash from plants and factories settled on the trees. And all of a sudden, the population shifted to where you've now got 95% dark, 5% light, and they call this evolution in action. A couple of problems. Number one, you're still a moth, right? You're not turning into a fern or rhinoceros. That's problem one. Problem two, even though you go to museums, you see displays of this, Never, ever do we see moths resting on tree trunks, this particular type of moth. You say, wait, Brad, man, you, you just showed moths resting. Yeah, the moths I showed you right here, they're dead. They have been pinned or glued to the tree trunks. Because think about it. When a moth lands on a tree trunk, does it land and spread its wings out? No. No. These have actually been staged using dead moths. In 40 years of research, people don't see moths resting like that on tree trunks. Number two, moths don't have a tendency to choose a matching background. You don't see a black moth going, hey, I'm black. I need to find something dark to land on. They don't do that. Number three, and probably most importantly, Nobody has been able to actually replicate the original guy, Kettlewell. They haven't been able to replicate his findings. You know what we call that in science? Rubbish. And yet, do we keep using it in textbooks even today? Oh, yeah, because it sells the image and the idea that we want to sell. Just like, for instance, well, this is a, a quote from a... Uh, textbook writer. Take a look at what Bob Ritter said. He said, you have to look at the audience. How convoluted do you want to make it for a first-time learner? He said, the advantage of this example of natural selection is that it's extremely visual. We want to get across the idea of selective adaptation. Later on, they, talking about high school students, later on, they can look at the work critically. In other words, later on, they can decide if it's true or not but it sells the image we want it to sell. It's kind of like those embryos that all of you have probably seen. Embryos, this is actually the original drawing done back in 1874. The way to look at these, let me start over here. Bottom left corner, you've got a fish, a salamander, a turtle, a chicken, pig, a couple of mammals, and finally a human. At three different stages of development in the womb. So three different stages of embryo embryonic growth. Now, the guy who drew these, if you look across the top, they basically all kind of look the same. And the reason they look the same is because Ernst Takel believed in evolution. He believed that we all evolved from a common ancestor. In fact, he said his turning point in his thinking was when he read Charles Darwin's book. Those of you who know your history, that he actually visited Charles Darwin at his home there on the mount. You say, okay, so what? what's, the, what's the problem? Yet the problem is this guy right here was convicted for scientific fraud. He completely made up his pictures, and yet we're still using them today. Now, get that for just a moment. He's convicted of fraud in the 1800s, and yet we're still using, oh, now we've colorized them, we made them prettier, 
but we're still using the exact same things. Now, top row, the top row is Ernst Haeckel's pictures. The bottom row is the real McCoy. But the bottom row doesn't sell the idea that they want to sell. Several years ago, uh, an evolutionist, well-known evolutionist by the name of Stephen Jay Gould, he actually kind of reprimanded his colleagues. He wrote an article called Atrocious, where he was asking, hey, why are we still using this data, that we, this, this example that we know is false? Look at what he said. We should therefore not be surprised that Haeckel's drawings entered the 19th century textbooks. But we do, I think, have the right to be both astonished and ashamed by the century of mindless recycling that has led to the persistence of these drawings in a large number, if not majority, of modern textbooks. A hundred years of mindless recycling? Yeah. Or how about this guy? Bill Nye, the science guy. I don't talk to my television that often, but I'll tell you what, when he was debating Ken Ham, I was talking to my TV. I know Ken Ham pretty well, and I know Ken Ham is very smart. Ken Ham is the guy who runs the Creation Museum, the Ark Encounter, and I knew Ken Ham could definitely take this guy. The problem was... Ken Ham was trying really, really hard to mesh Bible and science at the same time, and it came across looking like he was using the Bible as a crutch. And I'm sitting there the whole time thinking, just hit him with science first and then bring the Bible into it. Because Bill Nye, he's not a nice guy. Bill Nye has made comments like, denial of evolution is uni unique to the United States. Trying to, to make it seem like we're the only ones that would ever deny evolution. Well, obviously, this guy didn't do his homework. Because in the peer-reviewed journal Science, they actually looked at public acceptance of evolution. You'll notice it's not us at the bottom. It's actually Turkey at the bottom that believes more of creation than the United States. We're not the only ones. He goes on to say, when a portion of the population doesn't believe that, it holds everybody back. So if you don't believe in evolution, you're holding, you're holding the future back. To which I just wish I could talk to Bill Nye and say, you ever heard of a guy named Sir Isaac Newton? Probably the greatest scientist of all time. This is a guy who, if you didn't like physics when you were in high school, this is whose ankles you'd want to kick right here, okay? He dealt in physics, calculus, mathematics. I mean, this was a genius of a man in science. And yet, Sir Isaac Newton wrote papers refuting atheism and defending creation in the Bible. In fact, Sir Isaac Newton said these words, I find more sure marks of authenticity in the Bible than in any profane history whatsoever. I'd just love to know if Bill Nye thinks that Sir Isaac Newton was holding us back. Because no offense, but Bill Nye, he couldn't hold this dude's shoes when it comes to actual science. Or, or how about somebody like Johann Kepler? Johann Kepler who was the founder of the field of astronomy. Went to seminary for two years. He said that astronomy was thinking God's thoughts after him. He also said, I see how God is also gloried by my endeavors in astronomy, for the heavens declare the glory of God. Isn't it interesting? The field of astronomy was founded by somebody who believed in God and the Bible, and yet it's now been hijacked by Big Bang theorists. Or, or how about somebody like Blaise Pascal? Blaise Pascal, who, who came up with things like hydrostatics, differential calculus, the theory of probability, and yet it was Blaise Pascal who came up with that famous wager about how can anybody lose who chooses to be a Christian? You know, if, 
if you're an atheist and I'm a Christian and we both die and there's no God, neither one of us lose. But if you're an atheist, I'm a Christian, and there is a God, you lose everything. You notice in the Christian position, you, you're never in a losing position, right? Blaise Blaise Pascal's point was, hey, you can't lose if you're a Christian. Or how about Robert Boyle? Again, one of the founders of modern chemistry. This is a guy who, those of you who studied chemistry may remember Boyle's Law. This is him right here. When he died, he set aside a large portion of his estate to be used for funding what's called the Boyle Lectures. Now, you would think, if this guy's the founder of chemistry, you're going to have lectures about chemistry, right? No, his lectures are for proving the Christian religion. And yet, here you got Bill Nye out there telling people, oh, if you don't believe in evolution, you're holding us back. Now, I actually think the opposite. I think if you start with your science excluding God, you're holding us back. He goes on to say this. So, once in a while, I I get people that really, that, that claim that they don't believe in evolution. Kind of like, you know, every once in a while, I meet one of these weird three-headed green-eyed monsters. I mean, they're they're really some of these weird backwoods, Bible-clinging people out there. And I'm kind of going, hey, Bill, um, you know, statistically speaking, we're in the majority. Because about a third of Americans firmly reject evolution Only 14% of the population think that evolution is definitely true. Only 14%. And yet he's out there going, man, every once in a while I actually meet somebody. I'm thinking, Bill, maybe you ought to get out of your little hole sometime and actually meet people. It's sad to me because ultimately... This question right here is at the root of everything. And our young people want to know. They wrestle with, where do we come from? Why am I here? Where am I going when I die? What I want to do before I open it up for your questions is, I want to just remind you of kind of where we started last night. Remember last night I said, there's really only two options. Either you're the fortunate mistake of countless biochemical morons, or there really is a God. Put a different way, somebody made everything, or the world made itself. Now, when we look at the evolutionary explanation, textbooks, they all go to Big Bang, right? And yet, as we've talked about, that Big Bang, it doesn't give a really good answer for how everything got here. In fact, if we were to actually put it on a scale and say, which one is more logical? The Big Bang Theory or creation? This one says, after many billions of years, all the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area. This may be no larger than a period at the end of this sentence. Then another Big Bang may occur. Over and over again, this is their answer. Big Bang cosmology. And yet, we put it beside this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's weigh the evidence. Which one is there more support for? Where did matter come from? We know it exists, right? So where did it actually come from? Evolution would say, well, we came from, remember that little red dot? That small little point? The universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero, not as it got bigger, became filled with even more stuff. Now, what I didn't tell you earlier is that the universe, this Big Bang, has been on a major diet, okay? A keto-type diet. Here's why I say that. You go all the way back to Isaac Abimov, Isaac Abimov back in the early, about 1950s. 
He said that it was a few light years in diameter, that the original matter for this Big Bang. Then we skip down to 1965. They reduced the, the original matter for the Big Bang to 275 million miles in diameter. By 1972, we're down to 71 million miles. <laughs> Jenny Craig. 1974, we go on Weight Watchers. We're down to 54,000 miles in diameter. 1983, we go to a trillionth of the diameter of a proton. Anybody see what they're doing? They started out saying, okay, everything came from this big lump. Well, okay, it wasn't that big, it was this lump. Well, no, not, not, not quite that big, but, you know, th this little lump right here. No, not that little, this little proton thing that you can't really even see. That's what we came from. Okay, that's, that's their answer. In fact, Scientific American several years ago, they say the observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. It's then tempting to go one step further and speculate the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. So here is their answer. Their answer is, we came from nothing. Now, remember, we're weighing these two sides, right? Martin Harwood, he said this, the silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. So on their side of the equation, they would say the Big Bang is how we got everything, and that nothing gave rise to something. What about the Bible? Again, if you have your Bible, open it up to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I want to show you something some of you have never seen. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, that very first verse, you're actually given the five scientific principles that we measure everything by. Time, force, energy, space, and matter. The five things that we use to measure things, you're given all five of them in one verse. In the beginning, there's your time. God, there's your force. Created, there's the energy. The heavens, there's space. And the earth, there's matter. All five elements in the very first verse. And yet, I'm supposed to think it's more logical to believe that I got this box of nothing, and from this box of nothing, we got all of this stuff? No, uh-uh. I'll take this any day. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, the, this is the history of the heavens and the earth. When they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power head, power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Some of you may be sitting out there going, okay, what does it matter? I mean, really, bro, what, what does it matter if it's six days or six billion years? Now, what, what does it matter if God created man directly or we evolved from some Neanderthal? Folks, it matters because if there really was no creation, then there really was no creator or savior. Go back and look at John chapter 1. By the way, it matters because the very foundation of the creation account is being compromised. And if I can't trust the first couple of chapters of, of the Bible, why am I going to trust anything to follow? You say, well, but Brad, that's just, that's just you know, Genesis. It's just, a, that, it's just a parable. That's what I was told by one professor at a Christian university. He said, no, nah, that's, that's not real. It's just a parable. I said, okay, if that's a parable, help me understand how in the world, if there's not an Adam and an Eve and an original sin, how do you explain the whole scheme of redemption? Because the way I read it, man and God was just like this until sin entered the picture. Sin wrecked that. Genesis chapter 3 
The relationship did this right here. And the rest of the Bible, from Genesis 3 all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, is trying to tell you how to get back into that covenant relationship with God, ultimately through Jesus Christ. You take out the opening chapters of Genesis, you just undid the whole scheme of redemption of man. So do I think it's a big deal? Yeah, especially since you factor in the the reality that Jesus Christ was there at creation. And if you're telling me, hey, you know, creation didn't really happen like that. That was a big bang. You just took out Jesus' role in one of the greatest things that's ever happened. Some of you guys are visiting. And guess what? I don't know where you're supposed to go tomorrow, right? Right? I know we're not supposed to steal sheep, but since I don't know where you're supposed to go, plan on being here in the morning because we're going to keep going. In fact, if you're a preacher of a neighboring church, your job is to leave here, go to your church building, put a sign that says we're meeting at Cave Springs in the morning, okay? Steve, what time do we start in the morning? Oh, I thought he said eight. I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, yeah, you go start at eight. I- 10 o'clock in the morning, be right here. We're going to pick up on why I choose to believe the Bible. As a scientist, Brad, don't you, don't you believe all this science stuff? I hope you'll make plans to be with us at 11 o'clock. I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and hopefully we'll present a lesson that will stick with you for a very, very long time. In fact, I hope it impacts your life in a, a good way. I will stop right here because I've been talking a lot today, and I'm going to let you guys talk for a few minutes before we dismiss and go home. Questions, comments, thoughts? Wow, that's easy. Okay. He said, isn't the, the Big Bang Theory on the decline with scientists? He's absolutely right. Problem is... They don't have another godless theory to put in its place. So they keep propping it up even though they know realistically it's, it's not a good theory. Great point. Yes, ma'am. Yes, millions of years, billions of years, yes. So there are a couple of ways that people try to squeeze millions of years into creation. One is what she just said, the, the day-age theory where we're going to stretch each day into millions of years. The other is they try to say, well, maybe there was this gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis, uh, actually 1-1 and 1-2, that there was this original creation that had all the dinosaurs and all this stuff, and then, then everything was void. And God started over. And I'm like, wait a second. Um, there are a lot of problems with that. Number one, if that's true, why didn't he say anything about it? And number two, if you look at Scripture, it says the first man was Adam. So if we had a, an original creation with dinosaurs and men and all this stuff and fossils, and then it was null and void, why aren't we talking about them? And the Bible also says that sin ushered in death and that would require a lot of death before so it doesn't fit scripture to answer her day age theory I could spend a lot of time talking to you about well if you look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 5, 8, 13 19 over and over Moses uses this phrase he says evening and morning were the first day evening and morning were the second day so he is describing it as an evening and a morning He then gives it a numerical adjective, day one, day two, day three. Look at what he says in verse 14, where he gives you three elements of time in one verse. He says, God said, let there be light in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. Days, years, seasons. That sounds like time elements, right? If each one of these wasn't a 24-hour day, as you and I recognize it, but rather millions of years, what in the world is he talking about in verse 14 when he specifically mentions days and years? But my wife always says, keep it simple. So I'm going to keep it really simple. 
Okay? Anybody ever comes up to you and says, well, you know, maybe each one of the days is millions of years. Simply ask them this. What is needed in order for a flower to reproduce? Remember flowers, all the, the herb yielding, fruit bearing plants were put on here on day three, right? Got to have sunlight, got to have water, got to have the right atmosphere. But almost every single flower, especially if we're talking about fruit trees, other things, they have to be, and Steve, yeah, Steve and Sean can really jump on it. They got to be pollinated. Fruit trees actually have to be cross-pollinated. Okay, when did those little wing creatures come into the picture? Well, let's see. Day five, water dwellers, wing creatures. So are you really ready to say each one of these days is millions of years? That would mean God put all the green flowering plants here on day three. You had to wait two million years before they could be pollinated. Folks, I don't care how you look at it. That duck won't hunt right there. Sorry. All right. Any more questions? Yes. Great question. She said, all right. If we evolve from apes, why do we still have apes, chimps? I'll tell you what they would answer, how they would answer. What they would say in a classroom setting is, well, technically we didn't evolve from apes. or ch We evolved from an ape-like creature. And we got one branch, and the chimps got the other branch. We got the lucky branch. Most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Other thoughts, comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, if you think about, okay, so I actually have talked to a couple of students during the breaks, and I'll say this out loud so everybody can hear me. I believe in microevolution, okay? Microevolution is simply, yeah, you can have changes, but within limited parameters. You know, we can make dogs, get different kind of dog, but when you make two dogs, you still get a dog, right? Same thing with pea plants, you can make different kind or fruit flies, you can get different kinds of fruit flies. But you always get fruit flies. You don't get a fern or rhinoceros, right? If evolution is true, how do you add new genetic information to the DNA of something to say, get wings? What he said was, we should be losing information, which is right, but in their world, we're gaining information because we're going from a single cell amoeba evolving up to a complex human. We're adding a whole lot of genetic info. How do you add genetic information if all DNA is supposed to do is copy itself? They can't explain it. So you're right. We should just be losing it through mutations, deletions, etc. Good point. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sacrificing. Um, I wasn't there. But I will go back to Genesis 1. Um, actually, let, flip over. Let's look at. Look with me at. Oh, let's see. I was looking in Hebrews. There's a passage where it actually points out about his uh, his offering, but I can't put my finger on it that quick. 
If you look just in, um, in the text of Genesis chapter 4, they're making sacrifices. So the sacrificial system is already in place. I don't think they were eating it because Genesis chapter 1, 29 and 30 say, hey, I gave you all these plants for food. And we don't read anything about people eating meat until after the flood. And so, you know, like it or not, I think that was the original plan. Yeah, it, you, you add all the different little things up, like it would have required death as far as for them to, if they're going to eat animals, well, then you kill something. But the Bible says the thing that brought death into the picture was sin. So, uh, you know, how long, by the way, how long did Adam and Eve live in the garden? Because I've heard some people say, oh, maybe they lived in the garden millions of years. That's how, we can get. okay, no, no, no. First command that God gave Adam and Eve was to be fruitful and multiply, right? Now, that being the case, we have to assume that they were trying to complete that command to be fruitful and multiply. The very first child that is mentioned in the Bible is actually mentioned outside of the garden. Which, if that is the first child, that puts the outer limit of how long they were in the garden? About nine months. Gestation. Because we have to assume that they were trying to have children. By the way, I think their DNA, their whole fertility deal was a lot better than ours. They didn't have all the fertility problems we do. I think they probably would have been able to have a child pretty easy so do I think that there was like long long no mm -mm. other comments thoughts questions yes sir in your experience do you think our Christian colleges and universities are still teaching creation or have they started to shy away I would love to stand up here and tell you that our Christian colleges are boldly teaching creation, but I don't want to lie in this building. Um, I've had some very, very frustrating experiences. Here's the, here is a sad statement right here. I get invited to public universities a lot more often than I get invited to Christian universities. And the reason is, when I go into a Christian college, they know I'm going to teach a six-day creation, and that's not necessarily what the kids are getting in either the Bible department or the science department. And it's very frustrating. I've had conversations with several professors about what textbooks they're using, what they're teaching. I've got kids that send me their class notes, got pictures of tests. I know what's going on in the classroom. And the bottom line is, in most of our schools today, we're teaching a compromised theistic evolution. Yeah, there's a God, but he used evolution to get us to where we are today. Why would we be teaching that? You know, think about that from just a logical perspective. If man evolved, at what point did God look down and go, all right, now, now I'm going to give it a soul. Does that make sense to anybody in this room that he would, you know, have some ape-like creature go in a couple of thousand million years and finally we get this guy that's walking upright and he goes, oh yeah, okay, now I'm going to give it a soul. Because the reality is everybody in this room has a soul. I wish I could say that, yeah, they were, we were defending this thing. Um... Here's what I've learned in my, my short lifetime. At some juncture, every Christian school has to decide, do we want to go with enrollment and numbers? Or do we want to hold fast to what our founders really stuck with? And the minute you go with money and enrollment, you're going to end up compromising the initial beliefs. Good question. Any other questions, comments? That God created everything and he's walked away? 
then why pray? You know, I mean, I, I think sometimes we believe that in the church. We kind of act like that. It's like, okay, yes, God was active back then, but he, he doesn't do anything. Now he just kind of sits back in his chair and, and watches out over things. Folks, if you don't think God is active and living today, why do you pray? You know, why, why, do, why do you, why would you worship something that's just in sit back in cruise mode? A God who loves you enough to send his son is still very much active and living today and using providence to make sure that you're impacted, hopefully, by his word. It's my hope and prayer. I've been praying this for a while. Tomorrow morning, it's my hope that his word is going to change the life of some people in this room. I don't think he does that just by sitting back going... Where did our blessings come from, right? Yeah. Good point. I do hope you'll plan to be with us tomorrow. Look forward to that. Also, Sunday night, we're going to be at the spring. Say that a little bit louder. Springdale High School. Um, Area-wide type of deal. Hope you guys will be there. We're going to be talking a little bit about Parenting about raising disciples, not just pew sitters, about what's going on in the church, how we're losing some young people. If you look across this room, there's a generation missing. And it's not just here. It's actually better in this room than it is in most congregations I go to. Many congregations, you won't see anybody from about 22 to 35 missing a whole generation. So make plans to join us. Appreciate very, very much. It's been a long day. You guys have given up a lot of your time. I appreciate that more than I can say. I'll stick around for a few minutes if you got one or two more questions. But as you can tell, my voice is starting to fade. So I will disappear here in a little bit. But it has been a great day to be with you. Let's close in prayer. Our glorious Heavenly Father, we bow before you tonight acknowledging you as our creator and our sustainer thanking you for life and for breath thanking you for all the evidence around us the invisible attributes that clearly show your handiwork we thank you for your word and the power it has to transform our lives Heavenly Father, help us to open that word, to use that word in our homes. Help us to instill it in our hearts and in the hearts of our children and grandchildren. We thank you so much for the evidence, for the proof that you have given us. Give us the courage to talk to our neighbors, our coworkers, and our friends about you. Open the door so that, that we can teach other people these truths. Thank you so much for all those who are here today who've given of their time. We ask that you bless them, bless their families. Give them strength in this battle that is going on. Help us to be better husbands and wives, better parents, grandparents. And Heavenly Father, help us to be intentional about getting our families to heaven. We thank you so much for the love that you have for us, for sending your son to die on that cross, for washing away our sins. We thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen.